As I started listening to music, I wanted to be just like my dad. But I never realized how powerful these sounds could be. Where's everybody going? Lisa! My name is Santino Vaca. I'm 14 years old. I currently attend Smith Tech High School. I like to listen to music, collect the music, hang out with family and fixing cars, different things just to keep my mind busy. In 2003, Santino Vaca was born in Lincoln Heights, approximately 55 years after the original Pachucos were common on Broadway, Daly, and Main Street. He was born three blocks from the Lincoln Heights Recreation Center, where 42 years before his birth, a group of teenage musicians known as the Romancers were laying the foundation for what would become the East Side Sound. His young life would be shaped by his surroundings, the rumbling of lowrider cars cruising through the barrio, the sweet sound of vocal group recordings known as Oldies Bagudis. These were the same things his father and grandfathers enjoyed. Between the 1940s and the 1970s, Los Angeles was the destination for thousands of Chicano and immigrant workers, seeking the dream of a new life for the young families. Besides their labor, which helped build Los Angeles' infrastructure, these workers also brought with them their food, art, and music, developing an organic culture that embraced traditional forms of Mexican music, as well as the music created by black musicians. Music called rhythm and blues. Like Boyle Heights, the East Side, and a dozen other barrios in Los Angeles, Lincoln Heights was a destination for many of these young migrants. Lincoln Heights, Los Angeles, the original East Side. This is the soul of Lincoln Heights. I'm from Baca Senior. I'm born in Guadalajara. I grew up in Tijuana. I have three brothers. And I think I was like probably 12, 13 year old, I still was living in Tijuana when I started listening to the beautiful music with the pachucos in Tijuana. I used to see their carruchas, I used to play the music, I used to walk to the store, I used to talk to them. I used to see these real pachucos, the nice cars. And I said, oh my God, where did they get these nice, beautiful cars? And I saw the license plates, oh, in California. One day I'm gonna go and buy my carrucha leather and play the music, the ones I love. A key element in the rise of Chicano culture was attitude. The working class had a two that said, yeah, I drive a 10 to 20-year-old car, but I'm gonna make it look firme. I'm gonna take these old work clothes, starch them down, crease and cuff them, and I'm gonna polish my work shoes, so when I step out, I look chingon as it. I may not have much, but pride, shit, I got a lot. My jefita used to love the song uh, with Sunny Cher, Baby, Please Don't Go. I first thing I went to Goodwill and I found the record. I said, oh my God, hey, God is with me. Jefita, look at, I show her the record. She said, okay, mijo, ¿qué es eso? Pues ya listen to, we listened to this song in Tijuana in 1974. When I found it here, she said, oh, where you get it from? I told her, oh, that's a nice song. And she cries, and she didn't know English. Ni sabía que decía, ni yo tampoco. Pero the music, the sound, it went in the heart. We came in the Greyhound. When we arrived to Los Angeles downtown, I love the city, especially the buildings, the people, friendly. From there, we came to the neighborhood we call it Lincoln Heights. My brothers were there working, playing music all night long. Nobody will bother you. You play the music driving around. I came to the United States in 1974. I was 14 years old. And I came to Los Angeles, I saw the difference. Big buildings, a lot of raza, my family. And I saw my brothers working in all cars, like I love to do that. My dad, when he was 14, his older siblings were already here. My uncles all got together and gave him his first car with uh, an agreement. You, you gotta go to high school, finish high school, and that car is yours. My brothers, they gave me a 1956 Chevy Nomad. I didn't know what it was. When they gave it to me, I say, wait a minute, why you give me this extension? Why I don't have any kids. They laugh at me, you know? He would love listening to his oldies, of course. Uh, depending what he was in the mood, uh, he would listen to Ramon Ayala. He'd play uh, Chalino Sanchez in the 60 Apache. 
um, I mean, you name it, Donny Albert, uh, you know, uh, Shake, Rattle and Roll, I mean, 50s, 60s, it was just a mixture of different music. We'd wake up in the morning and uh, we'd get ready to go uh, to the car show or the picnic or cruise, whatever it may be. I mean, it was exciting for me because I was this 16, 17 year old teenager without a license, without a permit. And I was given this opportunity to drive uh, one of my dad's cars. He had a 1960 Apache truck, beautiful truck. If, if, you, if you know this truck and you've seen it, you know it was a badass car. And all the different cars that we've gone to, I mean, there was different, different races from black to white. And I mean, just they, they love the, the culture that we had, you know, of, of old cars and, and um, you know, representing, uh, you know, the Mexican flag that people would have in their vehicles. And, you know, they loved it. And my dad had this thing where, you know, whatever car you're driving, you have to know what, what you're driving. Because, you know, as you're kicking back at the car shows, people would walk by and say, hey, whose truck is this? And my dad would say, oh, that's my son's. So whatever car you were driving at that, that, at that car show, uh, that was yours. And when they were judging the vehicles, uh, they would call my name. And it was exciting to see my dad get happy because one of his cars won. And to be a teenager going up in front of all these people and them handing you a big trophy for a truck that you brought, it was just, it was amazing. I have the opportunity to live that life the way supposed to live, you know? My music, my memories, my life, because that's how I met my wife. Her name is Gladys. Heaven and paradise That's where I want to be Well, during one of those summer nights, I had a friend and we were out there hanging out and then one day she comes and tells me, oh, there's a guy outside who wants to know your name. And I told her, what guy? And she asked, she told me, she showed me who he was and, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 don't tell him my name. And I'm like, I don't want to know this guy. He had a, um, I can't remember, I think 1965 Chevy Nova, a square little number and, and it was a two door, so it was a small car. Everybody, like clowns, we would all fit in that car and drive over to like Griffith Park to go hang out and, and, and walk around the park and stuff like that. But um, there was always music and, and family gatherings and so it, it just kept going for a long time. The one thing about Frank is that he was very responsible. When I got pregnant, he knew that he had to be responsible for for what you know, what was to come. Um, so he's always been the guy that that does what he has to do. In 1974, Frank Senior would find his way to Lincoln Heights. The move would bring him the happiest times of his life, but the move was bittersweet because of all the prosperity and happiness the City of Angels had to offer. She also had the power to take it away. So I was going towards my house. My brother was there. We're talking, saying that what we're gonna do because it was uh, Father's Day weekend. So we were trying to plan to do something beautiful for my jefe. That was it, everything changed so quick that I didn't know what happened. I knew what happened, but I still don't accept it because like I say, I work hard to earn what I have. And after this, I got shot. When I heard what sounded like gunshots and living in the neighborhood we live, you know, occasionally you'll hear something like that, but you never ever in a million years would think that that would be in your own home. So I hear this vehicle pull up. Like I said, I didn't I didn't think much of it, but I heard that, you know, it stopped. I, I heard the motor kept going. So in my mind, I was like, well, I wonder who stopped. So at that moment, I turn around. And when I turn around, I see some guy lowering the window. And right away, I said, shit, something's going to happen. So my first is instinct was get my dad inside. I couldn't do it. He was too far away from the door. 
Um, so I just happened to pop in and I told my dad, get in, get in, in Spanish. I'm like, what the hell, what's going on? And I hear the first gunshot, bam. I was like, oh man, they're shooting at somebody. Next thing you know, I hear the first pop. And I'm like, oh shit, you know, like, what's going on? At that moment when the first pop went off, then I see my dad move. And then I started thinking, shit, did they shoot my uncle? The next pop went off. At that moment, I just seen him drop. So I looked out the window. When I looked out the window, I see the car leaving. And the guy saw me come up to the window and he shot at the window. So when I ducked down, I looked to my left and I saw my dad on the floor. I walked out and I see two feet and I couldn't put the pieces together. And so I, I go up to the window <clears throat> and when I turn to my left, I see Frank Lane on the floor. And my instincts was call 911. Fortunately, my neighbor, her daughter-in-law, she's a nurse. She walked over, ran with some towels, wasn't sure what was going on, and she stood with him the whole time. I, I felt like everything in my world was like gel, like it, it's so unreal, just waiting for the doctors to tell me what was next. Later, I got a call telling me someone was waiting for me in the waiting room, and it was a priest, my priest for the local church. And that's when I broke down. I had I had an opportunity to let go of whatever I was feeling at that time. To see the man that you spent 30 plus years with and not knowing what was gonna happen next, I had to be that stone, not just for him, but for everybody else, for my children, for my brother-in-laws, because that was their little brother. Um, to this day, I think this is the most time I, I'm shedding a tear because I continue after almost six years is to be that stone for the whole family. In my mind, this was gonna happen to me. After I came to the United States so happy with my jefita in a bus, like a tour, I was on vacation. I came to get together with my carnales to have a beautiful life. From there, I start feeling so sad because I couldn't have any more time to spend with my family, with my grandkids, to enjoy my carruchas the way I'm supposed to because I, I work so hard to earn what I had. To be 100% with this, um, uh, the reaction or feelings around me, uh, they didn't, they didn't uh, impact me as heavy as anybody would have thought. Uh, was, I, was, I, was, I was still young, around the age of uh, eight or nine, uh, but as time came, it slowly all brought uh, the feelings that weren't there in the beginning uh, to be at once, to, uh, to know the grandfather you once had. Uh, he's still there, but he's not going to be the, the same. He was a totally different person after that. He, he, he sold his cars and he stopped the music. It's like it stopped. The book stopped and it closed and it started a new chapter. Uh, the new chapter was leave me alone. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to talk about it. He had a lot of emotional bouts, of course, you know. He's a, he's a very busy man. He doesn't know how to sit still, so I had to uh, contend with his emotional bouts and his um, his anger. He didn't want music. He didn't want anything. He just wanted to be laying down on the bed and just deteriorate. So he sold all his cars and all the music just shut down. But I do have to say, I do remember a lot of family, a lot of friends coming together and helping us and bringing us food, water, just just hanging out with us, just trying to, to show support, making sure that we were okay because they knew that it was going to take a lot of a, a lot of energy, a lot of emotions to uh, to just be there, you know, for for Frank. It pained him to to have to see these toys in the driveway and not be able to um, jump up and get in there and, and, and drive. He forgot what it felt like. He forgot what an oldies are. 
He, he just didn't want to know about it anymore. The light just shut down on him. Um, I tried, but he would say, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. Two years after the shooting, 11-year-old Tino's curiosity in his grandfather's records is awakened after hearing Tony Allen's Night Owl, a song recorded in 1955 and a Vario classic ever since. My grandfather never really shows his emotions, but I stepped in a little bit more because there was like a big piece missing and I felt uh, I just had to bring it all back together with the help of my family. I went out and I bought uh, a record player at a little corner shop. And then uh, my cousin actually held on to my dad's old stereo. And I told him, well, how much you want for it? He goes, no, take it, it's your dad's, you know? So I brought it home. I went to St. Vincent's, DePaul, picked up a few speakers, and that was my setup. Found a few record stores, and I went to these record stores, and I started buying 45s with the songs that I grew up hearing him play. So when I was doing that, it was another form of trying to bring him back. Not all at once, but little by little, he slowly accepts it with uh, music and just everything that he used to have before. My dad was slowly buying records. All I knew was the good old gold label, and uh, uh, it was mainly just to get back that, that barrio sound that my grandpa used to have. My son, Tino, goes, Dad, what are you doing? What is that? You know, he had no clue, he was about eight or nine. And I told him, look, this is a record player, this is grandpa's old stereo, and, and these are the songs that I grew up listening to with grandpa, you know? I had, it was the Falcons, Billy Stewart, you had Brent Wood, um, the, a bunch of the common, you know, the Midnighters and stuff like that. So uh, to him, it was like, hey, you know, that's cool. And then he'd walk away. It wasn't really anything to him. But when he started talking to my dad about the music, I think that's what kind of set that light on in him. And he came around and goes, well, dad, show me how to do this. You know, so to me, it was kind of cool to bond with my kids in regards to that. and and because it had meaning behind it. He would say, why do they play that music? They shouldn't be playing that music. It's OK. They don't need to play that music. And I said, Frank, you know that they love it because that's what you showed them. That's exactly what you showed them was how to love the music, how to love cars. And he would say, why does your son have to buy a car? I was like, Frank, that's what you loved. And I would just tell him, you know what, just let them. Let them do, do whatever it is. They just want to bring back something that, that's missing. Uh, if I can go back and set a goal, it would be uh, uh, just to put a smile on my grandpa's face. Uh, uh, hold on. Yeah. Uh, uh, just to... It'll be just to um, make the family happy again. Three years and 400 records later, Dino and his dad have become legitimate in the world record collecting. Now that my grandfather's in the wheelchair after this situation, I go with him to a cross street to the school to help him around the school, do things that he can because he's in a wheelchair. I'm like his legs to him. And it just gives him a better feeling that I'm there to help him and be more successful at the school. My dad was a big influence to me in this because at first I didn't even know what a record was or a turntable. All I knew was it was vintage, it was old. Uh, my dad pushed it more because he would bring back some, uh, some that I never heard or just the ones I've heard and it just started to go from there where him showing me old ones, I ha had to get more of, the, more of what the rare sound was. My son purchased a, an older car, a vintage car, and um, there was a problem with the car. And I told him, Frank, your son is having a problem with his car. Why don't you go show him? It took him a minute. But he went onto his manual wheelchair, jumped onto the motorized one. He went down there and uh, he showed him how it was done. And it was the greatest feeling to watch that man be able to do what that car needed. And you should have seen my son's face lit up because his dad lit up. So, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So then, I think secretly he was hiding behind my back that he was sending videos to my grandson 
on music that he used to hear. And my grandson would say, oh, that's cool. So back and forth, they would send videos on music that he used to hear. Oh, you know, I remember this song. I remember this song. So somehow, yeah, I saw Frank. He was, he was sort of kind of opening up himself again to his past. So I'm very hopeful that, you know, not 100% he's going to be who he was, but, but he can be. And, I, and every day I remind him that he has to enjoy life. This is, this is it for us. You know, we're not getting younger. Just, just live and, and enjoy that. So my grandson put some of that light back in him by starting up his records, by, show, by listening to it so loud in the back that, that he goes, oi, oi, mira, he's playing that song. So yes, there's a light. There's a light in there. And I, and I have to say thank you to my grandson because he brought it back to him, playing the music that he used to listen to. I see myself collecting records for a lifetime because music is something I'll always love that's in my heart and family. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Durant Jones and the Indications and got an autograph from them on uh, the LP sleeve. And I also got to meet and go cruising with uh, Pratt and Moody. I still get a little nervous when I'm about to play record around. Uh, what uh, I see him from a distance, uh, uh, think about what he's, what, what's in his mind or how he's gonna be. Uh, what is he, what is he thinking? Like, uh, just so I know how he feels. Uh, not to just uh, let him play it, uh, let it go through his mind and think in a negative way. I always try to uh, do what I can to make it be positive. You know, not just Tino, but all the children in this family. They have old souls. They all have old souls. They love that stuff. They love that old school stuff. But the music, like you say, rock and roll never dies. And I'm not dead. I'm still here. Thank God. Like I say, with that music, it made me back good, super memories. When I was young, my jefita, when we came, we arrived in Los Angeles the first time. So all the music, I thank everybody that gave the opportunity to my grandson that is doing that. It's in the familia, it's in the heart, and the generation keeps going. God. Whew. Growing up, my family was very different, real unique. I was just a little too young to grasp it all at once. I was taught about respect and work ethic for my grandpa. To me, it was like I was an outsider, looking in on doors that were being closed all of a sudden. The music is about feelings, connections, emotion, and memories. When I play a record, I can see the reaction in my grandfather's eyes. The barrio sounds bring him back to the happiest times of his life. Lost in 